part of a culture of food safety in a culture of controlling um, other risks like SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is doing our best as leadership in a, a restaurant, leadership within a corporate setting to really reinforce how big of a deal this is and that the individuals who work there have control over spreading this, this illness. What's up, Zach Oates here, author, entrepreneur, and customer relationship guru. Welcome to Give an Ovation, growth strategies for restaurants and retailers, where we find industry leaders to share their secrets to grow your business. This podcast is sponsored by Ovation, the actionable guest feedback tool that works on or off premise and is easy, real time, and actually drives revenue. Learn more at OvationUp.com. Welcome to another edition of Give and Ovation. I am joined by Dr. Ben Chapman, uh, and I am so excited that he's come on. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Chapman. He's a professor of food safety. He's a professor and food safety, safety extension specialist. Wow, that's like a tongue twister right there. Um, at, <laughs> at North Carolina State University, he blogs at the appropriately named Barf Blog. Um, and he's the co-host of the podcast Food Safety Talk, and he also has turned into the star quarterback of this pandemic. Um, he's been interviewed by over 350 outlets from Wall Street Journal to Vox, and uh, you know, grateful that you've taken your time to this uh, for us humble little uh, podcast here at Given Ovation. Um, so, Dr. Ben, Dr. Chapman, Professor Chapman, Ben. Um, first of all, I would love to kind of hear outside of the craziness um which is still going what what do you like normally do yeah no zach thanks for inviting me and, and having me on um so in my like normal regular food safety world life um i work a lot with restaurants uh grocery stores um consumers around food safety questions and food safety issues and so so i do i, I kind of do two big things. I do, I do research in this area. Um, and my research really focuses on what do people do and what does it mean from a microbiological standpoint? So, hmm. so for instance, we just had a, a paper published um, this week looking at how um, consumers prepare ground turkey patties in, in kitchens, in like an actual kitchen, not just asking them, but actually like putting up video cameras, watching it. And in those ground turkey patties, we put a surrogate bacteria, uh, well, a surrogate bacteriophage, where we could track cross-contamination around a kitchen. And so, so I do research into trying to get a sense of what happens when people prepare food in, you know, in a grocery store, in a restaurant, in, in a home, uh, and what it means from a risk standpoint. And then I do a lot of education, communication, outreach work on um, creating messages and, and best practices to try and change those behaviors from everything from norovirus to salmonella and E. coli, um, all sort of foodborne illnesses. But yeah, for the last, I guess, like five months now, it's been all SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 and, and food um, and way less in the, in the other pathogens. Yeah. So basically, if, if you call us to be involved in one of your studies, like be aware because we're going to have some fake bacteria that's going to get grown in our kitchen right <laughs> yeah yeah we do it we we have a facility that we do it that we built just for this kind of work Holy so cow. we don't we're not taking bacteria to anybody's home uh, they, we okay. bring people in to um to our kitchens that have video cameras all lined up and then we can go ahead and swab um and you know first of all see whether someone uses a thermometer but also swab to see where it goes and we understand um how well they wash their hands and, and that kind of stuff oh man so so uh, when I have you over for dinner, just cook the food before you get there. That way you don't get nervous. <laughs> well, I, you know, it's funny. It's like one of the things that, that I uh, take from, uh, I, I guess, sort of a famous guy in food safety who passed away a few years ago. His name was Dean Cliver. He was a professor at UC Davis. He, he said, you know, the, the biggest risk is not eating at all. So, you know, you don't, you don't last very long um, if, you, if you just decide you're going to avoid food altogether. What my job's all about is how do we reduce risk to make sure that, that food doesn't make us sick. Yeah, I love that. Um, so awesome. So Dr. Ben, let's, let's jump into a little bit. Talk to us about, um, first of all, 
there was a lot of questions initially, a lot of, um, you know, uh, speculative data around um, going from the airborne particles from our mouth to the food and then transmitting that through delivery. Um, so if we see workers in the back of the kitchen who aren't wearing masks, what is our risk as consumers of getting that food and, and how much should we be pushing um, our employees to be wearing masks when preparing food? So yeah, this is, it's a great question. And I think it's really sort of highlights the central areas that we know about this virus in, in a food setting. The number one thing, and this is not you know anything revolutionary and it's gonna be obvious, but the number one risk in, this, in these clusters of illnesses in this pandemic is being around somebody who is symptomatic or asymptomatic. You mentioned sort of the airborne virus particles. You know, what we're really concerned about is moisture droplets that contain those vi virus particles. That if you and I are in close contact with each other for 15 minutes, we're having a conversation, not on Zoom, uh, but right mm -hmm. next to each other. Now I'm at risk and you're at risk if we're not, if we're not wearing masks. Nothing's really changed for us when you know with that one risk being at the top of the list we then look at other things like in in the microbiology world we talk about fomites which are surfaces just you know hard surfaces soft surfaces that that can uh transport bacteria and viruses and so in a restaurant setting i think about things like condiments menus uh plates um you know uh, uh silverware all of those things are these touch surfaces that as a consumer or patron of a restaurant, I go in and I could transfer a virus to my hands from those, from those surfaces. What we know about the virus and what we know about fomites are, are it's possible to have virus, the virus particles, you know, the moisture droplets and virus particles mm -hmm. end up on those fomites. And it's possible that I transfer it to my mouth, to my nose, but it's, not very likely. It's not our, our number one risk of, of transmission, which is really this like person to person. And then let's step back to your question, which is, well, what about the food, right? That's, it's not a fomite, but it is something that we know from previous outbreaks and other pathogens that foods can be a vehicle. And we're not really in any different situation than we were in, in February when this, when this conversation really started coming up, which is we don't have any data, any clusters of illness that are linked to food consumption or food handling. And it's not to say that we don't have clusters that are not linked to food settings like a restaurant. Um, we do have clusters there and we do have clusters of illness at um, places like grocery stores, but it's amongst workers the, and for the most part. And so our it's not, so it's not like a person to food to person. It's right. a person to person at that location that happens to be a purveyor of food. There happens to be food there. It could happen at, um, in, in so many different places as we've seen in, in businesses at events. Absolutely. So, um, so those are the things that we really want to want to focus on is okay. As, a, as someone who runs a restaurant, I want to make sure that, first of all, I'm evaluating my employees for safety, right? That I'm telling them it's important that if you're symptomatic, don't come to work. Even if you're asymptomatic and you've been exposed to someone who's tested positive, don't come to work. Mm. And I want to also add in that if I do come to work and I haven't, you know, I don't have any information about being exposed, I'm not sick, but I want to make sure that I'm wearing cloth face coverings or some other face covering mask, whatever's available to, to capture those moisture, um, you know, those moisture droplets. Because, and there, there are so many, you know, I think interesting risks within the food setting. Again, the, the risk of me working in the back of the house and transmitting it to a customer is pretty low. But the risk of me transmitting it from an employee in the back of the house to an employee in the front of the house, who then is gonna spend time over the course of a meal conversing with me, the patron, that's a different level of risk. That's riskier, right? Yeah. So, so I, the face coverings, physically and socially distancing, evaluating uh, the health of our employees, and then cleaning and disinfecting all of these hard surfaces that we touch, all of those, there's no like magic one, all of those things are important. And each of them put a hurdle in place to tr stop the transmission of the, of the virus. 
Gotcha. So, I mean, it's, it's all about, um, yeah, there, there's no silver bullet, right? It's, it's a bunch of things that you put in place. It's like mosquitoes. You know what I mean? It's not like, you know, you use yeah. bug spray, use a zapper, use one of those candles and all of those things minimize the risk of you getting a mosquito bite. Um, similar to what I'm hearing with this is it's not like you're going to do one thing. And it's going to fix it. Um, and, uh, and so what I'm also hearing is that a lot of the cleaning uh, of the tables and surfaces, a lot of restaurants are hiring sanitation captains and things like that. That is uh, probably more of a consumer perception than it is actually protection, right? Well, it's, it's tough, right? So what we're talking about is risk. And risk, we, we really look at risk in exponential differences. It's not like a one-to-one -one thing. So, so if I, and, and I'll, I'll give you an example that these aren't real numbers, but if I say that the highest risk thing that I do is person to person, well, it's maybe 10 times less risky worrying about these, uh, these surfaces or a hundred times less risky, but it's not zero. Right, and that's right. the really important part about risk. We never get to zero risk. What we can do is we know we have um, a limited amount of resources. To, to affect risk, like a, you know, to really, really focus on things. And so what I would, what I want to do and when I work with the food industry and the restaurant industry is talk about, well, where can we get the best return out of our, our risk reduction investment? And that's in person to person transmission. You know, the only, but just a couple of examples do we have of clusters from fomites, but it's not zero. So, so the more yeah. people we have, in restaurants, the more fomites, the more of these high touch surfaces that they're around, the risk still exists. And what we will really want to do is put place, you know, put all of these steps in place to keep that risk, risk reducing even more. But, but the number one thing, and, and what I really want to keep reiterating is, if, if I've got a server who's coming and spending time at my, at my, my table, inside or outside, that we're having a conversation like we would have in January, you know, that that real great customer service experience that I want when I go to a restaurant where they're telling me about the great things that are there and we're having a conversation. That's the riskiest thing to me as a patron. So Interesting. me having a mask, that, that server having a mask during those conversations, that really, really matters. The back of the house, having masks as they work in their team with the front of the house, that really matters. Those things really take that highest priority risk and effectively reduce them. Yeah. And so speaking of employees, as you know, uh, employees are coming on board where a lot of restaurants are starting from the ground up, um, managers and maybe a couple of people who haven't switched over to driving for Uber or you know, delivering with DoorDash, um, and as they're coming back in, how do we create this culture of safety? What, what are some tips that you would give to restaurant owners, operators out there? Yeah, and this is a really um, delicate and challenging situation. I think um, as you and I were talking about this, I think there's probably some shared recognition that this is a big deal, right? Like we're in the middle of a pandemic. There are millions of cases, uh, right? Like, like I, I, don't, I don't feel like you and I have to have this conversation where it's like, hey, Zach, this is like a big, this is not just like a normal little outbreak. No, no, but I'll, I'll send this to my mother-in-law. Right, right, right. <laughs> and this is the real challenge that we have, though, is that we have employees that, that may not recognize that this is a big deal, that don't know someone who has been sick, that, that might be in um, uh, you know, part of our population that just isn't consuming the news about this, that, that we haven't really connected with. And part of a culture of food safety in a culture of controlling um, other risks like SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is doing our best as leadership in a, a restaurant, leadership within a corporate setting to really reinforce how big of a deal this is. And that the individuals who work there have control over spreading this, this illness. Um, I, I, I'm dealing with this in lots of different aspects of, um, of life, you know, like, like you mentioned family members. I think there's lots of, you know, conversations that are going on on social media about this. Um, I, 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 my, I have two kids that play youth sports when we're not in the middle of a pandemic and, and talking about what the youth sports world is going to look like a year from now or three months from now or whatever, 
really trying to have conversations about this is a big deal. This is what we can do to reduce risk. And it's going to be awkward and it's going to be very different and it's not going away. It's so, not like magically yeah. in October, all of a sudden this evaporates. We're going to be experiencing this for months or years at some level. Yeah. Cause remember I thought everything was going to be back to normal by Easter. Right. right. And um, so what's, what do you think? I mean, what, what does this look like? Let's say that everyone starts wearing a mask, right? Uh, Walmart now you have to wear a mask there. Um, what should we be uh, expecting? Well, I think masks are, are going to continue to be the norm and expectations. I think, especially if I think about the restaurant industry, I think two big areas we're going to have to really rethink um, from a consumer uh, experience standpoint. One is buffets and hot, hot bars, salad bars, that world of many people gathering and lining up person to person transmission potential, but also all these fomites, how do we manage that? And I know in, you know, as I've, I've worked over the last five or six months on this with lots of people in the industry, the, the current situation is, well, we'll just eliminate them. We're not gonna do that. That's not part of our business. But I don't know what that looks like 18 months from now. I think we're really, as if it gets introduced back, it's going to have a different look. It's going yeah. to take different labor. The other thing, and I mentioned this earlier about condiments, I think if we look at quick serve restaurants, then drink stations and condiment stations don't look the same as they did in January 2020. And, and maybe never again. And that, it, you know, I, I was talking with someone um, recently in the grocery store industry, runs food safety for, a, you know, a major U.S. chain. And he said, for every hour of training that I put in place, if this is really, really important, that's a million to a million and a half dollar decision because I'm taking people out, out of our labor force. And so wow. what, what can I, what am I training people on that, that I can justify that investment? And again, this is, you know, a company that is in millions and millions in sales or billions of sales, but that's a real, that's a real, you know, big decision. So I think how we change, how we train people, how we change, how, what our expectations are in what a restaurant looks like and what that consumer experience looks like. These are not like we're going back to normal in October, 2020. This might reshape how the restaurant industry looks for, forever. And, and I, I, I look at something like riding, you know, um, being, uh, traveling in an airplane, mm -hmm. right? After 9-11, yep. the changes that exist around our TSA experience about taking our shoes off, um, you know, timing, you know, we're, we're 20 years past incidents that led to those changes and we still experience them and we will continue to experience those. So I, I think that this is one of those like landmark situations and I, I hope I'm not being too like trite and obvious, but this, this changes everything. And there's, there's no, you know, we're not going back to seasonal flu as our, as our big focus here in, you know, anytime soon. No, I love that. And I think, uh, I, well, I don't love that, but I agree with that and, and uh, wholeheartedly. And one of the things that I've, I've been saying is that we've, we've established this unwritten contract between restaurants and consumers over the last 200 years. And all of a sudden, that unwritten contract has been totally rewritten. And there's going to be new expectations, different expectations, and shifting expectations, which is, you know, uh, something that um, why it's more important than ever to really be in touch with your consumer to, to know what that is. Um, so la lastly, Dr. Ben, is um, what would you want, if, if you could give one message to all restaurant owners or operators, what would that message be? So, and I'll, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to give you like a really big answer to this one that includes <laughs> multiple things. Um, so, and, and, and I'll give you a little bit of context. So um, about early April, I started working here in my state uh, in North Carolina with my restaurant lodging association, North, the North Carolina Restaurant Lodging Association, um, our uh, Department of Health and Human Services at the state level, uh, as well as our tourism um, uh, promotion board, Visit NC, on protocols, as well as training programs for a wide variety of um, uh, 
uh, all you know operators employees different job tasks you mentioned like sanitation captains we you know cleaning and sanitizing job specific materials um to set a level playing field of expectations about that unwritten contract and and i and i think that so the program that we developed is called count on me nc and you know we've, we've had you know four or five thousand um, uh, uh, businesses that have registered, you know, 25,000 people have taken courses on this. But I think that the, the one big takeaway for me as an operator is go find a, a way to get trained on expectations and risk reduction in your restaurant. And again, these, my, our programs, North Carolina specific, there are programs that exist all throughout the U.S. that do this. But that's my big takeaway is this isn't managing the risk for this is not just like common sense. It, it's, it's a new space. The way that we think about this virus, the way that it moves, the way that we're putting in steps to reduce um, risk, how we communicate with our, our, our customers and our employees, all of that's changed. And so really seeking out those partnerships, working with the local health department, looking for training opportunities um, to understand what do I need to, what are, what's the framework that I need that I need to apply case by case at my restaurant is really my big, my big takeaway. Because like you said before, there's no magic bullet, but more information and, and training on best practices is, is something that I, I, I can't stop talking about um, amongst the industry. And can people go to count on me and see like, is that, is that a website they can go to to yep. kind of get your examples on that? Yeah, it's at countonmenc.org. Um, and uh, there's, there's five different courses there. It is primarily for North Carolina um, businesses, but we know that we've had multiple people sign up uh, to take the courses uh, throughout the world. Awesome. So Dr. Ben, here are my five takeaways. Number one, with all of this food craziness, the, number, the biggest risk is not eating. Love that. Uh, number two, evaluate how you can de-risk the situation. It's not going to get to zero, but find your ROI, your, your risk on investment um, to, to decrease all of these things. Uh, interesting. I, you know, the, it's all about person to person. If there's an intermediary, the risk is a lot lower, but still you want to de-risk those as well. Number three, get your employees up to speed. If they're exposed in any way, don't come in, make sure servers are wearing masks and make sure they know it's a big deal. Um, Number four, rethink long terms, buffets and condiments, drink stations. Um, all of that is going to be changing. And then lastly, um, I love that get trained for risk reduction frameworks. Um, check out countonmenc.org to, uh, to get some additional information on that. Um, Dr. Ben, how do people find you, follow you? Sure. So I'm on Twitter at Benjamin Chapman. Um, my program, my, my big food safety program at NC State is called Safe Plates. So if you Google Safe Plates, uh, North Carolina, you'll see my whole group's normal food safety stuff as well as everything that we do on COVID-19. There's about um, like literally like 130 different fact sheets that we've produced in the last uh, six months uh, on, this, on this topic. So uh, check me out uh, there and yeah, uh, find me on, on social media and, uh, and that's about it. Awesome. Well, Dr. Ben, uh, today's ovation goes to you for helping us stay a little bit safer, a little bit happier, a little bit more well-informed um, and uh, honored to be your 351st interview. <laughs> awesome. Let's keep that going. Thank you for getting the information out there, Dr. Ben. Great. Thanks, Zach. Glad you're with us today. And thank you. Thank you to the risk takers, the troublemakers, the crazies who are keeping this world clothed and fed. You're the ones who deserve an ovation. Again, this podcast was sponsored by Ovation. To see how we can help you grow your business, go to OvationUp.com. Don't forget to subscribe. And as always, remember to give someone in your life an ovation today.